Philippians 2, 12, and 13. And thank you again every week. So many of you share with you. I cannot even tell you how many of you stop me on the street and tell how much you enjoy our program. And I just want you to continue to support it with your prayers, with your giving, whatever God lays on your heart. So in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 12 and 13, reads, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. I want you to salivate on that. It, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And my subject is God is working in you. Hallelujah. I struggled with the title of this message. It first started with, is God working in you? Well, that's a question. Then I moved from there to let God work in you, a request, a plea. But when I went back to the text, neither of that was there. The text was clear that God is working in the life of the believer. Said it is God that works in you. And tell your neighbor real fast, that's a fact. That's a fact. The same God that was active in creating the universe, the same God that was active in creating mankind, the same God that was active in recreating mankind spiritually, God is active in the universe that he made and created and the man in which he breathed into and became a living soul. God is at work in the believer. Talking when I say it in you, I mean the believer. In spite of the unholy trinity, the world's value system, the, the lust of the flesh, and of course, the devil, the accuser of the brethren. And let us be frank, if y'all just allow me to preach my message. Sometimes we as believers lose a battle. Uh, we don't want to talk about that, but it's true. I don't know any saint that is 100% victorious every single day of their life. But here's the good thing. But from God's perspective, the war for your soul. See, you can lose a battle. The question is, don't lose the war. And the war for your soul and mine was won on Calvary's cross when Jesus Christ died for our sin. The Bible says it is through the death that he defeated the enemy. By giving his one and only son, the father paid too high a price to give up on you. John 3 and 16, that most of you can quote, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. The price for your soul, too high for God to ever quit on you. In the second chapter of Philippians, Paul is saying the believer should be obedient to God based on on what Christ did on that cross. That's why preceding my text verses, you have this wonderful statement, this hymn that begins in verse number uh, five. It says, in our relationships with one another, have the same mindset, the same attitude as Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or to cling to, but rather made himself nothing took the very nature of a servant, and this almighty God was made in human likeness. 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on the cross. And for those you being humiliated, look at Christ's example that humiliation ultimately leads to exaltation. Because he said, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow things uh, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. And every tongue confess, acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now you see what the therefore is there for in our text verses that come right after verse 11. There's no better example of God not quitting on his people than the Corinthians. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 1. I want you to see who is being addressed here. Paul wrote to the saints there, and I want you to clearly see the saints. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Satanas to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Paul is being used to bring the gospel to the people at Corinth, teaching us that the gospel is ultimately good news, not bad news. You see, in the first century of the church in that time, the Corinthians were viewed as low lives morally. To be called a Corinthian in that age and in that society was the equivalent of someone calling us as African Americans the N-word. So you could get into a fight just being called a Corinthian. Like us the saints today, even after being saved, Their past, their former ungodly life haunted them. Well, I'm going to get some help yet. See, after you get saved, you still got your former life pulling at you. See, we don't want to talk about that. We talk about people when they get filled with the Spirit, and now, you know, don't, don't none of the past ever come up, none of the temptations and lusts that come up. That, that's not true. Well, someone said, what's the sense in being saved? Well, I'm going to tell you what the sense in being saved, because when God comes in your life, now you got some power to do something about those things. You have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Paul warns them on the consequence of what we call backsliding in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 through 11 and I'm reading do you not know the unrighteous wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God so don't be deceived neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers and I know y'all not going I know y'all need to read this nor men who have sex with men this is the Bible nor thieves, nor the greedy. Don't leave out greedy folk either now. Nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And he said, then he tries to shame. We said, and that's what some of you used to be. Such were some of you, but you've been washed and sanctified. You've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. As I make these comments again. I am not going to be doing gay bashing. I don't think bashing anybody is ultimately helpful. All of them were delivered from their past. And so we must understand that clearly these were sins. Because he said, and such were. That's in, such were some of you. Your past life before sins have been forgiven. Your past life, now you've got the Holy Spirit. Like the people living at Corinth. We live in a world where everything goes 
as if God does not even exist, nor his holy and righteous laws. Some of you are not familiar with the book of Judges where the theme of that book is this, and everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. That is the age in which we find ourselves today. And even as I talk to people who haven't been born again, their concepts of God, see, what we don't get is this. See, people constantly create God in their own image. They do it all the time. They, they, view, they get an image of God that gets in their brain, and they feel that makes God. Well, in that case, we would have about a, a million gods instead of one God who has revealed himself to mankind through Jesus Christ and has given him, us his word that is clear on who he is and what he stands for. And I've always known that the people who have that kind of view don't even know the word. That's part of our problem today with so much going on because we don't know the word, so we don't know what to respond to. So we just follow the leading and guiding of men and not the leading and guiding of his word and the spirit. My brothers and sisters, there was a time when the mores of society at least somewhat aligned with the word of God. But it, it, there was a time when television went out their way to show us some sense of moral purity. The world said no to putting things above people, and so the world understood the need to put family first. And now we live in an age where so many people have put things above their family, becoming rich, making what good is all the money in the world, and you don't have the love of your husband, the love of your wife. What good is it? What good is it that you spend so much time away from home that the next thing you know your children are in all kind of problems, all kind of difficulty, because the world said no to not bringing the children to church. The world said you need to bring your child to church so that you can train them up in the way that they should go. The world said no to sex and profanity on television. Now, as soon as you turn it on, you don't know, even during prime time, family time, you don't know what in the world you're going to see. And if we don't, that's just TV. Let's not even get to cyberspace and social media. I don't even have time to go through all of that. The world also said no to being, having men with men and women with women. One of the reasons that it's not dealt with directly by Jesus Christ because the Old Testament was crystal clear, whether we look in Leviticus and other books, and the people, even when they did it, they, they knew it was wrong. He didn't even have to address it. It was so clear. So clear. He didn't even have to deal with it. Same-sex marriage was unthinkable, clearly against God's creation model. When you can't find anywhere in Scripture where the husband was not always a man and where the wife was not always a woman. As you all know, with the legalization of same-sex marriage, the unthinkable has become the thinkable and the doable. That that's the problem today. Scripture is losing its authority. That's not a good thing, ladies and gentlemen. A very simple illustration. <clears throat> I was with my mom uh, Friday. Uh, my mother, <clears throat> she, she makes lemon. She never allows the restaurant to make her lemonade. I'm not about to make it either. She, they got to bring her a gazillion lemons. <laughs> and she takes the lemons, squeeze them in, you know, pour her water in. You know, give it a little taste, put her sugar in it too, and put more lemon in. And at some point, there is the proper balance for her of lemon, water, and sugar. You can't get away that there's lemon in there that can be tasted, there's water that can be taken, the sugar can be taken. But if I was to take and have a much bigger jar and pour 
this entire pitcher of water into a much bigger glass, what would happen is this. The lemon would still be there. But the more water I would pour in it, the less you would taste the lemon. See, and that's what's happened in our world today. The Word of God is just being diluted to the point that though it's there, we don't even know that it's there. Come on, give God one more praise. That is our problem, the authority of Scripture. Even though same-sex marriage is legal, and we must honor that it's legal, but we must also take our position as Christian, then I'm off of this. In Acts chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, the apostles were commanded to not say anything more about that man we call Jesus. In verses 28 and 29, this is how they respond. Peter and the other apostles reply, we must obey God rather than human beings. You see, if we are going to be what God wants us to be, we must be willing to take a stand for what the scriptures teach. Now listen to me carefully, because our attitude must always be one of love. And not that we are condemning people, that's a bad thing. We just constantly condemn. No, uh, here's the phrase so that I can help you who are struggling with it. It is called, we must be welcoming but not affirming. Uh, welcoming but not affirming to those struggling with sexuality. And let me be clear, not just gays struggle with sexuality. I'm going you know, to get some amens right now. We got some single men, single women out here about to lose their mind being celibate. Just because you celibate don't mean you don't stop feeling. I ain't going to get no help out here. We talk about Jesus at the midnight hour. There's a whole new definition of the midnight hour. A lot of people don't even understand. <laughs> With things your body is feeling and, and trying to be obedient to God and his word, And yet, because that person loves God and understands what the Word teaches, they follow the teaching of the Word. And, and, and married people got issues too. Some say, well, if I had married, don't you know the sin nature does not work on the somebody principle. See, the somebody principle works like this. Uh, I've got somebody in my life, and I'm not going to desire anyone else. That's not how the sin nature. The sin nature works on the everybody principle. So I got a good woman, I got a good man, but he's handsome and she's fine. And you got to have some discipline in your life to handle that so that you don't destroy other people's lives. In this world, we must all have some discipline and some self-control. Just as we welcome the repentant sinner immoral, who's immoral, we welcome the repentant thief, greedy person, drunkard, swindler that Paul was talking about, former drug addict. If people are not repentant, becomes the question, then what do we do? I'm going to tell you. Our gospel message must still be one of love with those who do not carry the same beliefs as we carry. I, I'm going to wait for some praises on that. Because somebody's views differ from your views does not give you a right to hate anybody. Because God is love. And sometime in our rejection of people, they don't feel love, and we further alienate them from the love of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul reminds the saints at Corinth, like you gather here today and watching on television, to not return to their old lifestyle. Well, why? Because they have been washed, baptized. 
They have been sanctified, set apart by God through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. They have been justified, meaning that the crime of sin that every human being was guilty of based on the blood, they have been declared innocent and going to stand before God with no sins. In spite of us failing God at times, God never gives up on us. He never quits on us. Our salvation, I love this text. It is a profound text. He said, work out your salvation. In other words, some effort is required on the part of the believer. He doesn't say work for it because Jesus did the work for it on Calvary's cross. He tells the believer to work it out. Well, what do you mean? That means it is a following after, a fight a marathon race, a pressing on. Know what Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14 tell us. Therefore, my, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. Philippians 3 and 12 says, not that I have already obtained all this, Paul says, I have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of, but one, one thing I do, forgetting, what is behind? Straining toward what is it? I press on toward the mark of the goal of the high calling upward, heavenward in Christ Jesus. Last night I was at the gym work, trying to keep this body in some shape so it can last as long as it can. And I thought about presses, all kind of presses, shoulder presses that strengthen your Shoulder and, and, and chest presses that strengthen your uh, pecs and stuff so you can look good. And, and then I've hit on leg presses. I like leg presses. Say, say praise the Lord to the sister. Look at all that weight that girl got on there. But see, that's three. 120 times 2, 240 bar, 285. Bad sister. <laughs> but what we all know. And she does that press, and she has resistance, 285 pounds resisting her. But as she overcomes that 285 pounds, she gets stronger. You done it, mother? Amen. <laughs> you see, well, that's one reason she can run down these steps now at 90. She ain't sat around all day. You got to move. You want your body to work. You move it, you lose it. If you don't use your body, and you, some people make it up in their mind. No, none of y'all do this day. You ain't worked out in 25 years. Now you done listen to my message. You're going to run to the health club. The next thing you know, you're in the emergency room because <laughs> your body is going, you ain't done this in 20 years. I ain't been bothering you. You ain't been bothering me. What's the issue? But those presses teach us about the power of overcoming things that we resist. You see, as believers, we are in a fight. We have to deal with the world. We have to deal with the flesh. We have to deal with the devil. But every time you press, every time you get the victory, you become stronger in God and stronger in your faith. Just give me five more minutes. I'm done. You see, what we must begin to be clear about, the old time saints had it right. They would say, and I didn't understand as a baby saint what it meant. I just took their language. So when they said it was a pressing way, I'd be going on to it's a pressing way. I didn't know what a pressing way went. I'm 40 years in this now. I'm real clear on what a press means. That means if you're going to walk successfully with God, there are tests, there are trials, there are temptations, there are good days, there are bad days, there are ups, there are downs, there are challenges. You can't walk with God and not be challenged every single day of your life. It is a press. So when you ain't pressing, the Holy Spirit will deal with you. But if you're going to press, let me tell you some good things going to happen. You're going to fast more. You're going to pray more. You're going to study more. 
You see, pressing is going to give you a deeper sense of spirituality. And that's why God sends it so that you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of him. Let me give my final illustration. I'm out of here. Open up the doors of the church. Get ready to have communion. We have a real problem here as I end this text. We got to work out and a work in. That's a problem theologically because they seem to be going opposite. One seems to be saying that I make my own salvation work out. The other's work in seems like, well, now we're talking about God. So it creates what is called a tension between working out and working in. But it's not that difficult, you see. What really is going on, when you work out, that means there is human responsibility in your day-to-day walk with God. Yes, Jesus died on Calvary, but you got to walk with God and Jesus every day. So that gives us the sense of human responsibility and the sense of our need to be obedient to God. And when we fail God, to confess our sin and get right back up and keep on pressing. On the other hand, working in relates us to the sovereignty of God, that God has chosen you in him before the foundation of the world. And now God is saying, but I want you to be clear, you can do all things through Christ, but you can't do nothing without Christ. Am I making some sense to somebody here today? And what I started thinking about. So as you are working out your salvation, remember God is working in you both to will and do his good pleasure. Proverbs 20 and 24 says these remarkable words to us. A person's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand their own way? My next and final scripture. Some of y'all will recall that when Israel was going to the promised land, they didn't quite know how to go where they were supposed to go. So a cloud led them by day, and the Bible says a pillar of fire led them by night. So they were able to keep on traveling, whether it was day or night, because God was leading. Isn't this simple? How can you fail walking with God when you follow God? When you follow God, you've got to end up where God wants you to be. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to worshiping with you at either our 9 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. Sunday services that are biblically based, illustrative, contemporary, and timely. Our services cater to men, women, the young, and young at heart. We also invite you to join us for Tuesday night Bible study at 7.45 p.m. and Lunch on the Word on Wednesdays at noon. We are so thankful for your continued support of this ministry. And if this excerpt from our service touched your heart to either give financially to the ministry or to purchase the entire worship service on either CD or DVD, please call 708-283-0383 or visit us online at www.victoryapostolicchurch.org. 